I'll start recording. Okay, so I'm recording now. So uh, we're here with Nikonov Confess. And how Hello. are you doing today? I'm fine. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. So I have to preface this by saying that I have interviewed uh, quite a lot of musicians, but I don't think any of them have a story quite like you do. <laughs> so uh, yeah, but... maybe we should start from the beginning. You yeah, are, of course. That's you're good. a musician from Iran, of all places. Uh, so yeah. it's a country uh, with that has quite a metal scene. So uh, even here on Metalstone, we have quite a few people, quite a few users from Iran that I've encountered. Uh, but I can't say that I really uh, listen that much to Iranian music. Uh, how would you say firsthand that the music scene is over there? Um, I mean, Iranian people are always has, has always been a very big fan of art. I mean, because the country that I'm from, it has a very um, deep root in into culture stuff. You know, the the whole. Uh, 2,500 years of civilization comes with uh, lots of, uh, uh, from architect to like uh, painting, great poets, like classical poets in the history, and also in music, uh, like uh, Iran has its own traditional style of music that is very, that has always been very influential in the whole region of Middle East. <clears throat> and um, so in the mother art and uh, what we call, for example, heavy metal is one of the uh, maybe post-modern kind of, of art. Uh, it always has been uh, something that not because I'm a metalhead, but I can say very strongly that in Iran, it's one of the most popular genre of music. And, um, but the thing is that, uh, um, there has been a uh, like big artist that used to play something that is called maybe uh, some kind of a classic rock in 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they've been around and they were very popular. But after the revolution that happened in Iran in uh, 1979, uh, the whole approach to art changed and, uh, and uh, the trying to make everything Islamic and all of that. <clears throat> had a very major uh, impact on how people can represent themselves and represent their art. So I would say uh, genres like metal, like hip hop and those type of things became very underground. And then uh, in the underground scene, you always have that types of like uh, honesty in your art because you are not attached to establishment. You are not you don't have a big contract. There's nothing like that, right? So, um, so I would say the attitude in metal, uh, at least at the beginning, was very much like a punk rock in a British scene back in the days, right? So it was just uh, all for itself and just all for. It. There's this community that all actually support itself, hmm. but so a very uh, in the, a very authentic amateurship. Yeah, I would say yes, very true. Uh, but uh, like specifically about heavy metal, I would say um, because there is always this uh, this idea that government has about it, and it's a satanic music and everything. It always had a very huge backlash on on uh, on on the artists and also on the government because you also have to you always have to stay beyond the radar and just do your own thing, and then when something happens you have to um always have some explanation for what you've been doing right so we are always being considered as the underground artists that nobody knows what's happening in that basement and and everything so uh, in our case when we were arrested in 2015 uh which we will talk later i guess about it um it was like uh you um you've been questioned a lot that uh and especially our music was uh, very political and uh, criticizing about religion and everything. So um, yeah, it, it was a different story, but uh, I would say it's a very huge scene in their uh, music scene. 
and also about heavy metal is a it's a very huge and popular genre in Iran, and I hope that one day it can really show its real potential to the world because it has a huge potential. There's lots of bands, you know, lots of fans in there that they will get a chance to see their favorite bands whenever they come to Turkey or Dubai or whatever, because we cannot have metal bands in Iran to play, right? Because mm -hmm. I told you, they need to get permission. And even the Iranian metal bands, they need to get permission from government to go and play their music. And before that, they will check your lyrics, everything, so they can censor you. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, no, it's, it's not a very... Uh, a very strange thing uh, when I would say uh, maybe most of people in Iran know who Metallica or Slayer is, you know, so because we actually grew up with them. Mm. So actually the listening of heavy metal is not really a band or anything and even performing it is just uh, heavily uh, scrutinized. Yeah, it's true. I would say, uh, no, listening to, you can get an instrument, you can learn how to play it, you mm. can listen to your favorite music, but um, the I thing is that bringing it to the actual scene, it's not a story. Mm -hmm. Okay, so obviously people will look uh, a bit weirdly at you if you're wearing some uh, metal shirt, but uh, I don't think you're going to get in trouble with the authorities. So a lot of the stories mm -hmm. that you tell me about uh, getting permission and stuff like that reminds me a lot uh, more closely to that, uh, not exactly personal experience, but uh, with stories I've heard about uh, music in the communist sphere. Uh, so Romania, where I'm from, uh, was also part of... Mm -hmm. uh, the Warsaw Pact, we were under uh, com a communist regime. And also I, a lot of stories I heard from Soviet Russia where you had to get the state's permission because they have the Ministry of Culture and stuff. And yes. they had to get their permission. Because uh, I the mean, they're, they're, that's the thing with the totalitarian regimes. I mean, they act, act exactly the same. They just have different ideologies. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very true story. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, except that in, you, you didn't have that religious aspect of it. Yeah. That Iran is mostly focused on. Yes. Okay. Uh, and what I thought was most ironic about the whole situation was that they uh, criticized you for both being satanic and atheistic at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Which, yes. I guess doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> because, uh, but I mean, to them, it's the same thing. Is that uh, they see it this way. You do not believe in God. You're, you're atheist and at the same time you're satanic I mean, which as, as you say it's very uh, it's, it's very weird because at the same time if you're satanic you also believe in something right mm -hmm. but when you're atheist you do not believe in anything any higher power or all that but uh, yeah I mean that's a, there are huge paradox in all of this so yeah I mean that, that's one of the funny things well at least you're not Sunni no no no, I do not. I mean, my, my no. family also, here's the thing. I mean, my family also have been like a religious that much. Mm -hmm. But I mean, when you're from Iran, there's always this deep uh, Shia uh, Islamic thoughts deep down in, in the roots. Because it, it because I mean, if we're talking about 1,400 years, man. I mean, it just, it somehow, it goes deep down the roots of the society. But it doesn't matter if, if, if you're talking about Europe, Christianity is always deep down there, you know, mm -hmm. or if we're talking about, for example, now different types of Christianity, if we're talking about South America or Spain or Portugal, there's always like a, that, the Catholic thing under there, no matter how, how diverse or secularized the society has become, there's always, it, it, it will becomes part of the, the culture. So, mm -hmm. but no, me personally, no, I do not believe in any specific religion. Yeah, but I mentioned the Sunni part because I knew that Iran is like uh, the biggest Shia country. And I thought yeah. that uh, because generally you look more closely to scrutinize what's closer to you. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, some metalheads hate metalcore more than they hate pop music. So I thought that <laughs> yeah. perhaps uh, a lot of Shia Muslims would probably hate Sunni Muslims more than they actually hate people who are not Muslim at all. Yeah, man, you know, I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure about that. So I cannot speak on, on behalf of, uh, of anyone. But um, yeah, I mean, there is this, uh, 
this thing between she or Sunni that you know raised lots of problems in the recent decades but uh i don't know <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah like i said i i don't really know what the how uh, exactly do shias look at sunnis and sunnis look at shias i mean it depends that uh who uh, i mean the, who, which individual we're we're talking about yeah naturally the, yeah the the hate is everywhere at the same time and it's so it's not like that it's a it's a huge or uh the the major part of society but it it depends on where you uh what 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 were you thought and uh what is that you grew up with who you i mean who were your surroundings and everything but i mean uh the way that i was raised that just accept everyone the way they are and but as you say there's definitely a huge uh um uh, possibility that in the in the in the society that you're living and religion is a very has a very important and uh very uh influential role to play in there there are always lots of you know i think this way you think that well i hate you for it and all of that going on so yeah i mean i, I cannot say that it's not also true but uh i mean about me and about the people that i was in touch with i just try to accept everyone the way they are yeah i i had friends that they were muslims great people and uh, i had friends that they they thought exactly like me and we had a lot to you know share with so to me it's like a uh, it's the way it should be because it's not like everyone should think or like the stuff that i do you know Mm. Yeah and it's like uh the Islam culture the, the Islam religion has been part of Iran you said for 100 and so 500 yeah 100 and 1500 years so yeah, it's not yeah. like uh ever since the Islamic revolution it's just then that it uh that it started to become this uh this thing yeah. so it it was yeah, just... the, the the thing is that it basically just became the that it brought it brought the idea that uh kind of history old shia group of people a government and they should be in power and just basically uh it, it has you a leader that uh, that in their school of thought it should uh, it should lead the society into the place that it becomes the armageddon and the mm-hmm. fight between right and wrong and it's exactly the same thing as for example the israeli government thinks about they are the armageddonist government they they believe in those type of things that the, uh, that there would be a reckoning day savior comes and you know and and everything that you read inside the bible or inside the torah or quran or whatever so it's a uh, it's a very uh long and deep conversation if you're going to get in there which I'm not expert in it but uh, but since uh, you know I was grew born and grew up in there I know a, a bit about it. So no but Islam is not something that came to you on 40 years ago of course not. Mm-hmm. But but what I try to say that is culture and uh Islam managed to coexist prior to the revolution. Somehow. Yeah and it was a very hard uh, it was a very hard fight. Mm-hmm. It was a huge uh fight because uh The thing is that the Iranian culture uh before the invasion of Islam that we're talking about now it was something very different. So you mean they have inv- the what happened in the 7th century? Uh the thing is that in the um, there was this dynasty that we call it a uh, Sasanian and I don't know what it would be in English. Sasanian uh, but it was yeah 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 I guess. So uh there were there was like a, as far as i know there was a huge uh like a chaotic area in that time that everyone was just fighting to get to the power and the society was not very happy with the way that it was uh um it was back in back in the days so and at the same time islamic empire was 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 rising up 
Mm-hmm. And uh, Islam yes, was please. trying to, yeah, was trying to send the message out that, you know, this is a new religion. It's the last religion. It's the last messenger that uh, is coming from from God and God is only and all of that. So they send it to like the place that is Spain today. They invaded there. They invaded the Persian Empire and the um, Egyptian Empire and all of that. So, uh, and when they invaded Iran, they basically, uh, it was like a three options that people had. They have to convert to Islam. If not, they should have uh, pay something to live under the yeah, Islamic there was that, Empire. Uh, tax. I don't really know what. Yeah, it's like a tax thing. thing. Yeah, uh, something. Yeah, or or being decapitated, basically. So so many of Persians, they they were like, we do not convert to anything. We believe in what we believe. So they died, and those who actually converted because they had you know families and everything for farmers or you know what I'm saying is like exactly one thousand or four hundred something years ago. So, and since Iran had a very huge culture. They had to, and and Islam didn't have that. They and that's the thing with the with the with the countries that like Egypt, like Iran, like uh, like uh, Greece and uh, and and China or all of that that has a I mean civilization that is uh, has its own thing to offer. They have to come and try to fight with that. So just imagine how long my uh, my folk back in the days tried to fight. The, the 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 new people that invaded their countries to keep our own language because we speak Persian and Persian it's very different than Arabic mm-hmm. but the thing is that there is this time in the in the Iranian history Persian history actually uh, is the right word for that that um that we couldn't speak our own language for two hundred years because it was totally forbidden. So so many people stayed at home and tried to teach their own children in the in their houses uh, that you know this is your language, this is your culture, this is the way we dress, this is our ritual, this is our holidays and everything. But um, you know it's a uh, it's a as I told you in the in the I mean earlier it's a very long conversation if I want to get into that that uh, I guess uh, I'm not a right person. To, to yeah, those, you're, but, you're just someone who yeah. happens to be from Iran. Not you're not a necessarily yeah. a historian. Uh, yeah. But I was now that we're at this topic. Uh, a lot of times that Persia appears in uh, our cultural history, in our cultural uh, identity, not identity. Uh, whenever we think about Persia, we often think about the wars they fought with the Greek states. And usually, because yeah. uh, we're here in Europe, we think of them from the perspective of the Greek states. We think of yeah, the evil yeah. Persian Empire that tried to invade them, and we stood up to them at Thermopylae, even though yeah. we, they, they lost that battle. Uh, yeah. How is uh, this seen in Persia? How is the Persian Wars from the Persian perspective? I would say the same thing, man. I, the Alexander Gray came to Persepolis, burned it down. He was the evil one. Mm. You know, same thing. Yeah, it's like. Well, you will, I mean, as they say, uh, the, 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 those who achieved the victory write the history. So, you know, and, and, and the both sides, everyone thinks that they won the war, so they write their own thing. But you have to read the both sides and just, and just imagine that, uh, that, that how um, maybe, I mean, just find your own thing to believe. But I would say uh, an empire that wrote the first human right ever the Cyrus the Great wrote the first human right thing in like 2000 years ago, more than 2,500 years ago, cannot be an evil person, right? But the thing is that uh, there's this two huge power on the east and west side of the world back in the days, and they had their own thing to offer and they tried to coexist, but there was there hasn't been I mean there, there, there wasn't any rules of laws as today that how much should be your border or your territory so they and the, the dynasties coming and going and like the ambition and temptation and all of that makes them to expand their own territory so now here we go they're gonna have conflicts that for example Roman Empire and Iranian Empire 
in a period of time they had they were in fight for 28 years mm -hmm. so and that's what you're trying to uh, point out to but i mean answer to your question is the same thing is that the 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 evil empire of Romans were trying to invade us and we fought and kicked our father land and mm. you know yeah <laughs> you Persia guess. was that one part of the world that the Romans just couldn't conquer yes mm -hmm. and you you also yeah. to go back to our previous point once uh, the Arabic invasion happened in the seventh century they were really lucky because they they started it at just the right point where uh, Persia was fighting the Byzantine Empire. And the Byzantine yes. Empire was also re recovering from one of the worst plagues of to ever happen. Yeah. So yeah. like what third of the population of the empire had just died. So it was the opportunity. Yeah, I mean, it just, yeah, they were at their highest and the other empires were at the lowest. So they could overcome the, uh, the old rivals. Mm -hmm. that uh that once they were like very and and they came with the what i'm saying i do not mean anything racial or, or just i'm just trying to clear myself but they came with the grudge of ages because uh when you are being kept down or not being kept down but at least you see that you are not you do not have anything to offer you're not you're not a power so when you come to power you come with uh with that kind of sense that now I'm going to show you what's going on, and I'm and I'm gonna and I'm gonna teach you the lesson. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, there's a bit of that, but and uh, yeah, also the the world looks uh, looks at uh, doing the entire uh, Muslim faith quite differently now, uh, especially through an European lens, and especially mm -hmm. after what has happened in the past years. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe maybe some of that is a natural response to imperialism from uh, the Soviets or the British or the or the Americans, especially uh, mm -hmm. because Islam used to be uh, actually one of the most cultured places uh, philosophically and scientifically and so on. Yes. And some yeah. some time along the something along the way, I think, especially in the. 19th century once the british and the french carved up the ottoman empire something yeah. went astray something went very wrong they just decided to call this country lebanon call this country Syria, this one iran they didn't care about these countries there are tribes in there there are like shia sunni thing in there there's so many things in there and you cannot come from literally other side of the world and decide that Okay, since we won the First World War, this is my territory, and I'm going to call it this, and turn it into colonial. Mm -hmm. So that's the first uh, stone that uh, was put in the wrong place, and then it just ended up into what it is today, and you can see that. And there are, like, uh, as you say, uh, still to this day, so many um, outs, uh, outsider powers are having a very major role in this as you can see still to this day syria is a playground for russia iran turkey to decide that how they want to you know control the situation is not in the syrian hand, and uh and so many other things and also afghanistan happened a couple of months ago the u.s just came 20 years ago it was a catastrophe i think but gave also a chance to people to build something new and they were building something new for 20 years and they just left. And then, so what was the whole point? So many people died and from both sides and- yeah, not, uh, not to mention that they were the, the ones actually uh, funding the Taliban back when the Soviet invasion happened. Yeah, the Soviet invasion, yeah. I mean, what you're saying is very true and uh, and even if we want to talk about Iran, the thing with uh, the revolution in Iran was very weird. I mean, mm. since uh, the, the Shah, which was the last king in Iran, decided to not to sell oil at a very low price to U.S. and uh, like European countries, six months after that, it was overthrown. And at the same time, it was on, at his peak, right? At his peak. So and the revolution in Iran happened in like less than six months from the first protest to the to the like the last one and then Shah left the country and everything so you know and look still, how that backfired 
Yeah, look how that backfired. Exactly. I mean, it just it, it to me is that for 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 all it works, it just got out the got out of the hand. Uh, just got out of the hand, and just new people came to power, and they were like, "We don't need to say yes to you anymore." You know, fuck you. We are having the and and, and we are having our own ideology, and uh, and as you say, Islamic ideology has that kind of potential that is very has a very revolutionary thing in it. So it's, it's uh, so so many North African countries like Libya, like Egypt, like, like Tunis, like so many other countries, and even in the, in the Middle East, they used it against imperialism, as you said. Mm-hmm. So now they try to say that, okay, you know, so now they, now the, 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 the all the fucking ancient time is over now the diplomacy is in the, is something that we should try and, um, but you know, it's just everything that happened just lead us to here. And uh, and I don't think that it's a very good place. We need to change it somehow and just recognize the, the difference of people and just try to respect that because if we don't, it's gonna get way worse than this. Mm. Yeah, eventually it's, it's going to be an interesting place in 20 years. Yeah. I guess. Mm. Oh, I almost forgot this was uh, supposed to be a music interview. <laughs> you know, it's to me, it's it's all related because, uh, for oh, example, yeah. at least in my music, I mean, it's just uh, it's something that I talk about, not about history, of course, but uh, you know, history is uh, is a very important thing to talk about. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, as you say, it's a music interview, I guess. <laughs> Well, yeah, it, I think it's quite I know unavoidable to talk about this. Since I don't, I don't think you've had an interview where you didn't have to go over this the details no. over and over and over. No, again. honestly, honestly, no. We never touch these grounds, so I'm happy to be able to talk about it. Mm-hmm. So, but, and, and it seems like you are very interested in history and you have inf- information about it. Yeah, I play a lot of Europe Universalis. <laughs> Cool, I'll, I'll have you know that I formed Persia as a Zoroastrian nation once. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, Zoroastrian. Yeah, it was the it was the the, the fate prior to the Islamic one, I think. Yeah, yeah, it was the one that when Islam came to Persia, they were like trying to fight against the good mm-hmm. deed. Good, you know, and there's these three things that um, we in Persia we say. Uh, Oh my God, I just forgot it. <laughs> but uh, but but it's a very spiritual type of religion, and it's and it's the first uh, religion in the whole world that uh, in the in the history that believed in God is one, and uh, the and Islam was offering the same thing. So I don't know what were they trying to be uh, like making people to convert into Islam. So. Yeah, but I'm still, my mind is still at, at that uh, at that motto that Zoroastrian has, uh, which I don't recall now. <laughs> if you recall it, then let me know. Sure, of course, I will. Mm. Okay, so... Goftarenik, Goftarenik, Pendarenik, Kerdarenik, which means good thinking, uh, good talking and good deeds. Mm-hmm. It's all about the human. If you think right, you will speak right, you will act right. And, uh, and it, there's a huge philosophy behind that, which, uh, which there's still like a percentage of Iranians that are the minorities in Iran that they're still believe in that. Um, officially and, or unofficially? Uh, no, 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 officially. No, it's one of the, I mean, there's a thing in Iran, the, the religious, the, the religions that, that, that has a book mm-hmm. and, uh, and researchers, even in like, like Islamic researchers, they found the roots of this. So it's not a political, like the religions that in 90s uh, British empire tried to make, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, it's not like that. Is they will there? They are free to believe in what they believe. So mm-hmm. Christianity, Judaism, Zoroastrians, and uh, a bunch of others, like even Buddhism, and they are free to believe what they believe. They are not as cool as 
like Muslims to the government, as you can imagine. But no, there's no threat for them or anything. But you know, so many of them decide to leave, and because they feel they are second, second degree, the second class citizen in their own country, like yeah, no. Jewish. Yeah, like lots of Jewish people that left uh, as soon as the revolution happened in Iran. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't actually expect there to be an actual degree of continuity in the Zoroastrian faith. So a lot of neo-pagan religions in Europe were like completely dead and then revived by someone in a newer form. So like you had uh, uh, Slavic paganism, Norse paganism, yeah, that's, Hellenic uh, paganism. That, yeah, yeah, that's uh, I guess the, the, the drive for that is nationalism. Mm -hmm. and uh getting back to your roots and everything like that mm -hmm. which uh, yeah, it's also is yeah, it's also guess the invasion of the i don't think they necessarily believe in those things they do it more uh more because as a protest against uh how christianity was forced upon their countries years and years ago mm -hmm. yeah they just want to be like okay we are not with them so we need to build our own group of people and this is what our ancestors believed a thousand years ago. So this is what we picked, this is our flag, and this is how we like, put this on and just say that uh, we are having our own identity. But I think it always will be led into racism. Yeah. I mean, it's quite unescapable from that part. Yeah. Yeah. But this gets me thinking that there's a lot of Norse folk metal I don't think I know any Zoroastrian folk metal. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Maybe, I mean, you should go and like research among those who are Zoroastrian, who are mostly living in the center of, uh, of the Iran, mm -hmm. uh, the states that are in there. And uh, among themselves, there is a, in that area, there's a um, very old traditional Types of music, so maybe in there you will find something. I never yeah, that heard. Sound, that sounds pretty that. interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, how was your first contact with metal music? I I remember I was in a um, second. Uh, I was in a senior high school here, mm -hmm. and. Um, but back then, I, I even knew what metal is. I knew Metallica. But in, in that year, I remember I had a friend. He was my uh, classmate. One day, he came and gave me a CD in, in school. I go listen to this. I was like, OK, what is, what, what is this? So and, I, and back in the days, I used to listen more into hip hop and uh, Eminem, Tupac, and, 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 and those artists. So but when I went home, you have a DJ in your band. Yeah, of course. I don't know. I mean, it's just deep down. It's just, it's maybe part of that because uh, you will, um, you, I mean, well, hip hop always been a very huge part of uh, my musical career. I just love the groove in it and just the stuff that they talk about. But the, but just to uh, be specific, like uh, lyricism, I'm very, I really love that part. I really take it very importantly because I think it's very important what you're saying in your music. Uh, so, by the way, um, this dude just gave me the CD. I went home, put it in my PC, and then just Slipknot came on on the screen. The Slayer came on, Pantera. I was like, oh, my God, this is just so fascinating. The sound, the energy, the everything about this is just so, so mesmerizing. I just, I, I just want to do this. So... I, and uh, that was the point, that was the moment that it just really hit me. And uh, I would say ever since, which I was around like 12, uh, I, I'm, I'm doing this and uh, it's just, uh, you know, I just wanted to learn how to play the guitar. I just wanted to make a band, write music, and just do this beside everything that I'm going to do in my life. But at the same time, the more I did it, the more I got into it, it became the first priority in my life. But uh, I would say that that event totally changed my life. I mean, that that evening with that 
CD and uh, maybe 18 or 20 music video on that CD that was burned for my friend from satellite TV. It was like just so, so crazy. So it was a bootleg. Yeah, it was totally bootleg. Yeah, man. <laughs> Would yeah. you have been able to buy official music over there? Uh, if you want to buy, yeah. I mean, as I said, there is this also ministry that gives permission for everything cultural that comes out. So Pink Floyd, Hendrix, Muse, Radiohead. Okay, so yeah, stuff that Those is, stuff. It, it's a bit more and on I, the inoffensive I, side. I even remember, yeah, and I even remember that uh, a couple of Metallica's record could, could get uh, permission for that. Also, they were like, uh, for a yeah, time. Prob- but, probably I mean, not the one I mean, with the God that failed. No, no, no. <laughs> so they, they basically, I remember, I don't know which, which album it was, but um, they, they put out some of the songs out of the, mm-hmm. you know, out of the CD. And I think uh, they were, but it depends on which administration was on back in the days, because we also have lefties, righties, and you and everything that lefties are think that, eh, let's just become more, um, less radical and you know everything but the righties are like no we need to just have our own idea and just all the stupid stuff but um but at that time that lefties were in power which would be in the beginning of 2000 there were like um metal magazines in Iran not metal hammer it, it the Iranian metal magazine that talking about new releases I remember I had one of the issues that was talking about uh, toxicity of uh, System of a Down, uh, the Black Rain of Ozzy Osbourne back in the days. And um, there were like the books that was the lyrics of bands like Sepultura, um, Ozzy, Metallica. And, and I remember we bought them. And after a couple of years, we saw that they didn't reissue those books again. So, okay, new administration came to power. They were righties and they were like, enough of this. You know? Okay. So these little hatch in between that you you will find your f- more freedom in it. You know. Mm-hmm. So so you go and use it until the day that they stop that. Yeah. So it was like the Iranian version of Perestroika. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Like oh that. yes. But yeah. Except yeah, yeah. that it ended. Yeah. 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 Except that it ended. Yeah. Okay. And how did you get your first guitar? Uh, lots of begging. <laughs> I was like, at first I wanted to play drums, but my mom was like, we do not have enough space for it. It's going to be loud and it's going to be expensive. So to go with the guitar, I was like, okay, good. Yeah, guitar has an amplifier. You can use headphone and it doesn't take lots of space. So I just, uh, at first I need to go through this, uh, proving myself that I, it's just, just a temptation or just something that comes and goes so fast. So my sister used to have a acoustic guitar, but she didn't really get into it. So my mom and my dad were like, eh, hey, it's, it's the same story. You're gonna just buy it and then just put it away after a while. So you, you have to just go and just like start with this at the beginning, go to classes. And then if your teacher let us know that you are like really serious in this, no, it, it, there's no problem. We'll buy you an electric guitar. So I just proved myself, I guess. And then my, my, my musical teacher, he called my mom. I was like, yeah, I think he got it. So yeah, one day we just went and just bought my first electric guitar, which I think is one of the best days of my life to this day. It's like that feeling that you get that, oh my God, it's just like, I cannot explain it until unless you're a, you're a musician and you you've been there once in your life. So yeah. it's just a great feeling. I have musician friends, so I can understand the feeling. Yeah. But now uh, now I because none of them are new musicians, I more understand the feeling of wanting more and more and more gear, even though you don't need it. Yeah. Oh yes. Tell me about it. Man. I'm always saying myself, I don't need more guitars. I don't need more guitars. Oops, I just bought another one. I don't need more guitars. <laughs> it's really hard, man. Okay. And how did the band first start? Was this like your first band? Did it really hit off with the first one? Yeah, it was just my first and only to this day. And I'm, uh, 
I would tell you, I mean, uh, it was 2000. We started in 2010, but I had the idea since 2008, I was like 16, something around then back, back in, uh, in time. And uh, I wanted to start a band, but as I told you, my musical teacher was like, it's not about starting a band. It's about what you're gonna make out of it and everything and just, just try to learn the theories and just be more into learning. I was like, yeah, yeah, but I need to really start from somewhere. So it took me another two years to just figure it out and just talk to some of my friends about the idea. They were really good at playing music back in the days. Everyone was like just students were just still learning it. But I had, uh, I remember I had 10 songs that I wrote back in the day. I was a little bit ahead of them. So I had the songs and everything. And I was like, look, man, even if we have problem with recording, I can record some parts and then you can record, I can also record some of your parts. Just let's just record the first album and just start with this. So, um, so I remember it was, uh, you were going behind the microphone, you don't know really what you're doing. And, and the thing was that I uh, built a home very primitive and very like not very complicated type of home studio in my room just uh essentials like microphone sound card you know good guitar with a good pickup and like some soft uh softwares and, and things like that so we started recording the first album in 2011 and it was ended by 2012 uh beginning of dominion was the name of that and then it just came out on the first of January of 2012. Mm -hmm. So that was the that was the beginning of the band. But yeah, that was my first attempt, and to this day it was my only. Mm -hmm. Okay, and how is releasing an album in Iran going? Um, it was different, of course, 10 years ago. There wasn't Spotify around. It was like only SoundCloud that was like just recently. Uh, added into a musical, like a digital platforms. YouTube was around, of course. So it was like, you make your music, make a video, not just actual video, just something to put it on YouTube and just give a free link to people. Mm -hmm. Or the MP3 into a zip file, down, free download link, put it on your Facebook page. And, uh, and at the time it was just Facebook. So, um, it was, uh, and, and if you wanted to make physical out of that, which we always did, and I also started a, a record label in 2014 called Opposite Record to, to mm -hmm. do this also for other people, you, you went out buying like raw CDs and, and you talking burn them. to, uh, yeah, burning them and just giving it to, to this company. They will print the, but uh, like booklet for that or like uh, printing your CD and everything. So it was just everything by yourself. Exactly like the way that you hear from, for example, Gary Holt, how they did in 80s with their like uh, the, the cassette and everything. Everything is just by you and just you put it on your Facebook page, maybe 10, 20, 50, 100 people buy it, maybe not. You lots of just free giving to people. And, so very uh, DIY. Yeah, 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 very much. And, yeah. uh, and, I, and, and I think the bands that happen to do that by themselves, they're like having a very strong backbone because they really know what independent means, which comes with lots of disappointments, which comes with lots of effort and, and failing and just coming back and everything. And uh, yeah, we happen to be one of those bands that even in the 21st century, we did it old school. And uh, so when I'm talking to you, for example, Nick the Butcher of Mayhem the other night, and he's talking about the way Mayhem did back in the days, I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. we did it in also in 2011. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then I did listen to your second album right now, and I was actually expecting it to sound worse and on uh, production <laughs> side, but it actually sounds sounds pretty decent uh, on the recording uh, quality and so yeah. on. So how did yeah. you record that one? It was, mm, it was, I mean, at the same home studio, but also going to some studio that, that I had friends 
and uh, like putting on their speaker monitor and their good audio system and they just giving me like points that may be a little bit more low end, a little bit less high end. And then I just coming back because I mixed, I produced that album by myself in the same room that I told you recorded and mastered and everything, the first album. But it was a very different in the quality and everything. Uh, the, uh, the drums were recorded in Turkey, just mix it by myself also. And um, yeah, I mean, the thing with Confess is that if, if you listen to our catalog from the day one, the thing that you will be noticed after listening to a bunch of songs is that there's a very visible progress going on. Mm. In the sound so quality. it was not like one recording session, it was multiple recording sessions. Of course, yeah. The mm. progress in the like quality-wise, musicianship-wise, songwriting, vocals, everything. Because as I told you in the, uh, about the first album, we were also learning what we were doing mm -hmm. while we were doing it, okay? So there wasn't any room to mistake. And if we did any mistake, we were like, okay, because I mean, the thing is, I'm a model always, uh, mostly back in the days, not now, but back in the day, it was like, uh, this is going to be my best song ever. And when I release it, it's going to be my worst song ever. I, I just got to go way beyond that, like with the rage that I'll oh, fuck, I missed that one. I got to be, I got to become way better. Than, than the um, than the previous one on the like next release. So I guess that that mentality really drive me to to try to like come up with better ideas sound wise. And um, I wasn't ever educated in like a like those type of fields like the audio and the mixing and that. so everything just was with the ear and and I'm telling you man most of the times I didn't have a good headphone to do that. Okay. So you have to be very, uh, I guess, the word that I'm using maybe would be a little bit, oh, you know, but you got to have the talent to do it. It's not mm. just uh, because you somehow you got to know what you're doing. And uh, lots, and I told you lots of uh, failing and get up again and, and everything, but um, there's no budget. There's no people around you to tell you what you're really doing. And uh, you're making metal music in a country that this music is not a thing. And uh, I mean, it's just people listening to it. So, and you hear a lot of bad stuff, a lot of bad qualities, a lot of stuff that makes you feel like, oh shit, man. I mean, why nobody's making a, making an album, a song with a good quality. So it mm. kind of made me feel like, why I shouldn't try to be that one. And and while we were doing, we heard that there's also other bands coming into the scene that they are really having a good quality also, good songwriting, great guitar solos or like drum playing, vocals, everything. So yeah, I guess uh, for us bias. <laughs> mm. And did you ever get to play live while in Iran? We didn't want to. I did some shows with other artists. It wasn't metal, uh, more like um, rock. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, not to try to bash any any other artists that did, but I don't, my art doesn't need ex permission from anyone, especially a fucking priest. So it means that I'm, I should dumb it down to a point that satisfy a priest to give me a piece of paper and be like, now you can go and play. So mm -hmm. I'm like, fuck that. I don't need that. And especially my, my music, my attitude is not about that. And especially this music should not be about this. It should not be about and, the compromise. Uh, yeah, compromising, of course. And, and just, uh, so to me, it's like, I rather to, just make music, release it for free until the day that I get to a point that now I can do it better and, and you know, everything. So, but if anyone still to this day, because I know they go and get the permission to play the music, good for them. We, we never did that. We never wanted to do it, but we could, you know, we had fans that we could bring maybe 200 people to a venue, but I mean, never wanted to do that. I guess we are, 
we were standing on the other side of the fences and we're like, okay, we just, we're out to watch. Mm. But, and did you perform live now that you moved to Norway? Yeah. Um, I came to Norway in 2018, just started to complete a lineup, then the Corona happened, but during Corona, it was like, um, like a brief period of time between like lockdowns that we could play in places. We did our first show in Oslo, it went sold out, which was great. A lot of black metal artists like you know, Vortex, the ex vocalist of Demo, he just showed up. And uh, we met lots of great artists that came to our show and it was a great experience. We did, we opened for Mayhem this June in, the, in Norway. Mm, and uh, yeah, that is great. It was an awesome experience also. And just a bunch of other shows. We did a small mini tour in, uh, in Norway and we also have another one in the next April. Mm -hmm. So yeah, any chance that we got, we just, uh, we, we used it, I guess. Mm. To, to yeah, play now, now, now nobody is asking for your for, for permission no 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 the good thing is that yeah i mean the actually we were talking with uh with someone the other day about this that uh the biggest uh, difference between uh the the environment in here and iran is that nobody give a fuck what you think man you know what i mean like in the in the high rank political and there is just you don't need to get permission to go to when you play and you know why should you so so this is what uh this is what i call it the freedom that the, an artist in iran and countries like iran cannot have and you always should be very careful that oh if you're saying this what can happen to you or or you know how can you make shortcuts and just you know say something that that nobody in the power would notice and then years later, you can point out to, which happens in lots of cases. But yeah, and here it's not like a commission, you know better. <laughs> mm. Okay, uh, so it was after your second album's release that the police came to your house, right? Yeah, two weeks after that. Two weeks after it. And uh, so how, uh, was it something that you ever considered could happen? Mm. I mean, my, I knew that something going to happen somehow because we were going very <laughs> like headstrong. Head, head we were like, this is our image. This is how we're doing it. We're releasing a song with the artwork of a priest and a guy in suit in Tehran. Everyone knows where we're living. I put my, where I'm studying, which university in Facebook. I'm totally accessible. I don't give a fuck. But I was like, okay, maybe like one day I'm going to be arrested. They're going to smack me up a little bit. Give me a piece of paper to sign that don't do not repeating this again. But it was different. We went straightly to solitary confinement for three months. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, a, in a jail that is not joke. And in prison is no joke. And uh, so that was the surprising part. Mm -hmm. And when I'm saying surprising, it comes with lots of fear and, and like being scared because your life they, is on the line now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, the day I, before I you read in another interview mentioned that they kept uh, telling that they're gonna execute you today and they, they don't. Uh, the thing was with the blasphemy actually, the charges mm -hmm. of the, the, the blasphemy that I was charged with. And uh, there's this thing with blasphemy that, uh, as far as I noticed uh, through lawyers, is that if you are uh, questioning or somehow insulting uh, God at the end, you're forgiven. So you get from two to five year maximum in jail. But if you are insulting prophet or something that is related to him, you can be executed because he cannot defend himself and an Islamic system islamic political system is their representative mm -hmm. okay so it happened that by chance i didn't talk about profit or anything yeah. i was talking about god at, at least at least you were smart enough not to do that i didn't know that actually back then so that was the reason that the 
the execution thing was around for a year, year and a half until they couldn't pin this on us that you were talking about because they were like going right into lyrics was trying to find something that I'm talking about someone that is, you know, that can, can, can mean like a, a, of a prophet or something, you know? So they, yeah, couldn't. they were, they were looking for reasons to cancel you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, totally. So yeah. Early sign out, but they couldn't. So, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, now we're laughing about it, but back in the days. Yeah. Like, obviously you know, weren't laughing. It wasn't nice. Yeah. yeah. At all. And now, now you're mostly just sitting there. Uh, you're not afraid of the Islamic police. You're afraid of the poser police. So they're going to come and say that you're not playing real metal. Oh, no, not that. No, they actually in here, the criticism that you get is not that. Uh, you got to be more metal. Yeah, well, <laughs> not yeah. in the government, actually, but the listeners. But, I mean, the, the, the threat with the system is everywhere, I mean. I don't know. Have uh, you also wrote uh, about the recent history that they assassinate lots of their, you know, uh, those who were like in the opposite mm -hmm. of uh, like in the opposition and they were like living in Europe and during the last 40 years, they, they assassinate, they harmed a lot of their, a lot of artists, a lot of uh, um political activists and stuff. So I'm not saying that I, I think that this can happen to me or, or my band, but uh, it's not it's not something that it's too it can be too far away. You know, mm -hmm. so the threat that I mean there are still sometimes my family get calls from from like uh, certain people that they're like it's better to call him and tell him to do not speak so much. Mm -hmm. And your family yeah. is still living so, in Iran, right? Yeah, and mm -hmm. the re and the fact that they're also living in there, it gives us a thing to also be worried about because they can put on the pressure somehow, mm -hmm. and it happened in so many cases. So what I'm trying to say is that the the effect that 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 this event had in our life it's still going on, but it's not something that anyone can see. Right, mm -hmm. it's just some some stuff happening behind the scene that is on, is in our private lives, mm -hmm. but we choose to to cho choose to be this. We embrace it. We we are, this is who we are, and uh, and, we, and I see responsibility upon my self and my art to talk about stuff that so many people do not have voice to, to mm -hmm. say it, and uh, and just clear so many things that at least give my two cents that what's going on in that country and. Uh, there, and there is a huge generation that is fighting against it. I am just one of them, you know? mm -hmm. And it's not just me. When I went to jail, it wasn't just me and my bandmate. It's like from cartoonists, journalists, filmmakers, so many people and they're bright people that have something to offer, but it's not allowed the same narrative as the government is giving to people. Mm -hmm. They are questioning stuff. And they just don't want them. They're like, they're trying to pushing them and just be like, okay, just censoring. If we, if we couldn't censor them, let's just put them away for a long time in jail. So yeah, it's, it's really sad. And uh, you cannot return to Iran, right? I mean, you can, but you would probably have to face those. Maybe I even can't. I mean, uh, the, I know so many artists that are banned even from entering their own country, which is ridiculous. Just imagine that you're banned. I heard I, I was banned from getting outside of my country, but even you can be banned from getting to your own country. But yes, if I go to you know, Iran now, I would be faced with uh, 12 years and a half uh, um, of imprisonment, years of imprisonment and 74 lashes. And it can be even more than that because yeah, they, in, the, in the meantime, they might have more charges. Yeah. yeah, because I've been keep talking, I've been keep doing music, so it can be, be the like way more than that. Mm -hmm. So no, the answer to your question is no, until I guess the day that they're in power, people like me cannot get back. So you, you haven't know, seen because, your family since then? No, 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 no. The plan is uh, that uh, just stay safe until the day that it happens. But uh, no, 
haven't been seeing my family since uh, 2018. So it's almost three years. Mm -hmm. And there is no chance that they might come to Norway as well? Yeah, 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 sure. They can travel, but not like in in our hometown or, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, we can meet each other elsewhere, but not in Iran, of course. Okay. And how does it feel like to be driven out of your own country? Makes you fucking angry. Just imagine someone throw you out of your room. What the fuck? It's my room, you know? No, you, you, just because this is the way that you decorated it, you cannot live in your room anymore. This is ours now. So it makes you very angry. And that, and that, uh, and those people who force you out of your room are the ones that call themselves law. You cannot do anything, you know? And you slowly process this fact that you cannot do anything. Because at the beginning, you're like me going to the first trial. I'm gonna, gonna defend myself. I mean, justice, shit, all that. But then you will notice that, ah, it's just a puppet show. It's just, this is yeah, gonna, it's a formality. You're gonna go down and you're gonna lose this. So you, you're gonna smart up, you, you'll get dead. So um, it makes you very angry and also sad that uh, um, this is happening. You know, this is, the, this is your life. This is the reality and you have to live with that. But um, in my case, I happen to be lucky enough to have the music that is, directly about this and i tell my story through that not a lot of people are lucky enough to tell their own story while they're alive but people yeah. tell their tell their stories mm -hmm. uh, yeah, right. they have, they, that, at most they have stories told about them yeah and so, now you're, yeah, you're going to tell your story next january yes yeah as loud as possible <laughs> mm -hmm. okay yeah we're gonna play it as loud as possible uh, so Thank I you. think the one hour is up. So uh, how do you feel like you've grown as a musician since your last album? Grown as a musician? Um, because it's been seven years. Yeah. No, no, seven. The last six, album six. came out. Yeah, yeah, almost seven, yeah. Um, I, I saw a lot. I discovered a lot. I felt a lot so much emotion, negative, positive, good things, bad things happen. I've been in many places, saw many different people. And um, I got so many messages from, from all of these events and, and everything that, that happened. And uh, it stored somewhere in, 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 in my head and while I was writing the music, for example, the, the music for the new album, Revenge at All Costs, which it says what it's about. Uh, it was at the time that I was bailed out from jail. I wrote that song, for example, Evan, when I was, when I was just recently released from jail. So it's just all raw, pure and real emotions. And the lyrics that I wrote was at the darkest time of my life. And uh, there is hate, there is, sense of power determination in that. There is fear in there. There's absolutely hope in that. Uh, and um, so I grew up a lot. I, I would say if we were talking about a period of six years, it's like, to me, it's like someone is now in his 40 or something. I'm 28 now, but the more you live, the more you get experience, the more you grow up. And um, to me, it's like something that I'm very honored to be able to also channel all this energy in the most honest way uh, into a platform that is art. And um, I really cannot wait to share this with the world and just tell them that you can you can fall and get up and fall and just get up but just also build something that everyone will be shocked at the end that fuck we didn't expect this you know because everything is possible in your life as long as you are 
you 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 like lock yourself in and just follow it and just no matter what happens to you because you know that you're on the right side of history you know you're following it and and just uh and make people inspired also at the, at the best is this just what you're trying to do but yeah i would say it's uh, it has been a very crazy roller coaster ride for me so i just try to just make the best out of this and just put it out that you know someone maybe out there can learn something from it mm. yeah it's it's a horrible event that has happened to you but i think uh the world will be richer for it because it because of the new album in a way also man you know yeah this the, what you said is a is a tragedy that can be turned into triumph you mm-hmm. know yes you are losing you 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 lost something along the way we are talking about being away from family all of those being in jail for a year and a half is no joke i went to jail when i was 21 i came out when i was around 23 i'm not going to get that back ever again mm-hmm. okay and it wasn't picnic i wasn't in picnic for a year and a half i was in a fucking bad situation but the thing is at the end it was all about doing what you wanted to do following your interest your talent your love and i did that and now yeah here you go this is 10 songs 11 songs that i put and it was a very uh there was lots of ups and downs into making it also but at the end you did what you wanted to do so so you're the winner you know so and that sense of i want this war gives you the passion to following this again and again so don't be like ah you know i just did it so no we have a lot of plans and we have it's, yeah, they, it's just a it's just a new start they couldn't beat you all, man i was just talking to my friend an army couldn't stop us revolutionary guard is an army in you and they arrested me but they couldn't stop me no yeah that's that's very inspiring and indeed uh okay <laughs> so uh the last question then is sure. other than the people themselves what do you miss most about iran the smell it smells it smells different the country smells different that you can feel it iranians that are living outside of iran and they those who are in exile in this mandatory exile they know it they know it and and there are artists that left Iran 4 years ago when the revolution happened and to this day they are they're old now and they're like i wish that could some of them, their interviews are talking about i wish i could die in my own country or at least be buried in my own country because there's something i mean anyone can say the same thing about his own country it's just so cliche if i say oh iran is this we can say the same thing about romania someone from other country can say the same thing but it's home man you know it's no matter i mean when you leave your home you do not have a home anymore it's just your house i have a house i don't have a home my home is somewhere else and uh and it happened that i'm also someone that is like the whole world is my home but at the same time there's this fact that you have memories you have feelings from there and you just suddenly over uh some tragic event just happened to lose touch with that so it just also it always gives you that feeling that uh you know you're you're far away from something that is very uh lovely and just and also yeah i i think my family is the biggest part my memories some like specific places i have very good memories of just all my friends uh but yeah i mean I guess that's the biggest miss. Mm. Okay, so thank you for giving us your time. Do you have anything else to add to our readers? Uh yeah, once again, thanks for having me. It was a very nice conversation with you. Um uh, yeah, our new album is going to come out on 21st of January, The Vengeful Cost on Rexit Records. It's going to be out on all platforms, uh, digital platforms. Also, if they want to support us through Bandcamp, they're out there confess and you know they can find us 
And uh, yeah, thanks for your support. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're going to have to burn these ones yourself. No. <laughs> Thank you. You're also part of it, but, but not exactly like the way we did it. <laughs> Yeah, now you have someone yeah. else to burn them for you. Okay, so once yeah. again, thank you and have a nice rest of the day. Yeah, you too, man. Take care. Bye.